What temperature are you frying your catfish at? That question to a chef changed his career. Learn why. Welcome to Decision Points. I'm Doug Hudson. I'm Scott Wood. And welcome Jack Gibbons, CEO of FB Society. What's up? Thank you for having me, guys. Good yeah, to be here. Glad, glad you're here. You're, glad you're here. Uh, Jack uh, knows one of the team members of True North. Uh, Armando is his name. And in fact, he said, you guys have got to talk to Jack. Why do you say that? I have no idea, but I know... Uh, <laughs> They've the his family's been close family friends for years and they're they're special people. Where were you raised? Where are you from? Originally from Philadelphia. I'm probably the only Philadelphia Eagle fan in Dallas. Still an Eagles fan. Still an Eagles fan, but would never want to move back to Philadelphia. Yeah. Um but So do you hate the Cowboys? No, no, I don't hate them. No, for you sure. sure. For sure. You're not lying. Fact, You're not just uh, saying that for the camera. No, no. <laughs> I, I've actually done business with them as a company. They're a great organization. I, I think Jerry Jones is a a role model as far as his business decisions is, is unbelievable, actually. So, Jack, I agree with all of that. But on Sunday at three o'clock, I'm cheer for the Eagles. <laughs> <laughs> There's no doubt. I've got a wife who I married who's a Cowboys fan. So, you know, we, we kick and scream depending on the score of the game. So, and I did a, uh, a video shoot at the Eagles um, Center 10 years or so ago, right after they won the Super Bowl. And this was like, summer camp okay and we pulling into the facility in philly and there are 20 or 30 fans with signs that say dallas sucks at spread summer camp the fans are intense but you know uh, it's kind of interesting so everybody has their passions i, I love football right yeah. so um what and, and entrepreneurs need to take time out and find things. And I, I try to actually plan things with my family. And that's one of them with my son. He, he just so happened, even though he lives in Dallas, had the connection of being an Eagles fan. So we go once a year to a different Eagles game. Oh, no way. And they just announced today that they're playing their first game in San Paulo. I saw that. So I'm, I text them this morning, hey, do you want to make that our annual trip? Wouldn't that be fun? You know, I just thought that'd be super cool. So Jack, just there's so much to unpack right there. What a great parenting. I mean, Scott and I have known each other a long time. Have a one-on-one -on -one time with a child and experience that they love oh, i i think people should take and so it's of course lessons learned right because yeah. we all screw up we get we take our work a little too seriously yeah. and then all of a sudden you realize well what's really important right so i plan a summer vacation every year with my family i have a daughter that lives in new zealand son here and a daughter who just started school so we're empty nesters so a couple of years ago we started planning every summer my wife and i plan an epic trip yep. you know so we did Croatia last summer where, you know, everybody flies in. It's like, we just do everything right. This summer we're doing Japan on a cruise. So, and then the following summer, I think we've already decided we're doing Vietnam. So, but like you have to do something epic with your family. Cause it's, it's the things you always remember. And yep. I think that, you know, it, it's sad if I think my best memory was opening a restaurant. No, it wasn't. It, mm -hmm. it was spending time with my family in a unique situation, you know, that we'll never forget. Walk us through that. You finished high school, college. Walk us through some of those early years. I grew up in Philadelphia, but my heart's in Texas. As soon as I got here, I never wanted to leave, you know, and I just fell in love with the state, the whole culture. Philadelphia, when I was growing up, it just felt like a, a, a place that it probably if I finished college there, I would have never left. Huh. Um, where uh, Texas just seemed to like the land of opportunities. I, I went down to Houston to go to college yep. uh, from Pennsylvania. How, how'd that happen? I mean, that's a big jump. How'd you find Philly? It is. I, I applied to, th I, I started school at LaSalle in Philadelphia, okay. but I just felt like I needed to like find, get, get away and do my yeah. own thing, yeah. right? So um, I applied to uh, University of Houston, UT, UCLA, and somewhere in Florida. And so and it just, the one that I could start at right away was Houston. And I was like, I'm in, you know, no so, way. and, uh, and that was, those were all warmer climates. Yeah. They, all, did that have anything climates, to do with it? I mean, <laughs> and I guess, was there some fascination with Texas at that point or just more of the warmth than just, yeah, like I really didn't, I had never been yeah. there. I'd never been to any of them, you know? No. So it just was like, uh, to get an experience, right? So that, that word experience is really important. I think to, my whole career and yeah. it sort of started, you know, um, I, where I kind of became cognizant of it then. So, you know, and going through an experience of going to a city you've never been to, you know, as like a 19 year old kid, Incredible. it was awesome, you know, and it really like, it started growth, personal growth. And then 
when you come to a place like Houston in the 80s, like it, it just was like unbelievable what was going on, you know, foreclosures of homes and, you know, but I got involved early with this organization. It's called Pappas Restaurants yeah. and uh, started at the first Papacitos, went to the first Papado and really cut my this teeth This is mid 80s? Yeah. Uh, so this is, call it 1980. Yeah, about 1982, 83. So is that know? your first job out of college when you graduated from University of Houston? Actually, I did it while I was going to school. Okay. So, uh, and were you a server when you started, or did oh, you start at the, at no, the corporate I, office? I started as a server. Like so I go. just was like... Uh, at Papacitos or Papados? Papacitos. The first Papacitos, and I walked in, the environment was just um, so on fire. Like It was so exciting. And it, this is when like people were discovering fajitas and margaritas. And oh. It was lines out the door. and Eighth wonders of the world, yeah. by the way. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. And so... And, and it's funny because in college, you go to college and, um, you know, you're supposed to always be in debt. I, I was like rich around people because I was making like 200 bucks a night 100%. serving tables. And back then, college was like $100 an hour. So And you it, were learning <laughs> high ticket, two, three margaritas. Totally, yes. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it sharpens your sales skills. It brings out personality because you got to connect the, with uh, tables to get big tips. And it's really like, so I, you know, as young people, and I've watched my, my kids have all worked for my company, all worked in different jobs. And so you see personal growth and yeah. people every day in the restaurant business. And so it's why so many people are attracted to it. All right, so keep going. So literally you're working at the first Papacitos. First Papacitos, so- And at um, that point, Jack, in that family, how many concepts did Papas have at that time? Oh, they probably had like eight or 10 restaurants. They had barbecue. Um, and Kind of one of each at one, that point, One though? of each, yeah. It was okay. really small. They had one Papacitos. I started at the first Papado. They had probably a couple of these Papa Seafood houses in Houston. Yep. And they were just in Houston. And yeah. so, but they had like unbelievable real estate. Yeah. And they were a really smart company because they bought their real estate. And so, and especially in the 80s, it was dirt cheap to buy exactly. properties yep. on pl streets like Westheimer or Richmond or around the Galleria where today you, you yeah. can never afford them, you know? Their value, arguably, that's a whole other conversation, is their real estate, not necessarily their concept. It is. And because those, you know, you, again, today you can never afford to put a restaurant on Correct. them. You'd have to put a high rise on them. Correct. You know? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. I mean, you talk about the Chick fil A's and the, the exactly if that concept ever goes out of style it's okay the real estate is gonna they're gonna take care of it. Oh, no question so uh they're they're in a good place in their their careers and their lives and they've, they've done really well and made a big impact on me because i was one of those kids that I, I i didn't like school all that much i just didn't take it seriously and so at one point i was going to leave uh college and i had a manager review and my my goal was really to become a gm of a papado and Chris Pappas sat me down and said, hey, if you don't finish college, you can't be a general manager in this organization. Wow. So <laughs> what did I do? I went back and I finished college. And so, Kudos you know, and, and I, I wouldn't have done that, I think, if it hadn't been for him really, you know, putting it down. And at the time, they had a very strict rule that was like, you could not be a general manager in the organization unless you finish college. Yeah. So, you know, that, that they had a great influence. And so I ended up working for him for 25 years. No way. Yeah. So I ended up, um, you know, went to Papado. Papado was a new brand at the time. And uh, that was 1986. Okay. And uh, it was on Westheimer. And, um, you know, it was the time of my life. I met my wife there. Uh, we've been married for 30 years since then. Um, What's her name? Uh, Hannah. Hannah. Where's Hannah from? Where'd y'all meet? I like specifically, where'd y'all meet? Oh, we, we met at Papado. Of um, course. She's, she's uh, grew up in Hawaii. And so she's, you have this beautiful girl from Hawaii coming in to interview. And I got the interview her and I, was, I went up to my, my boss at the time. I was like, if you don't hire this cute Hawaiian girl, there's something wrong, you know? So. And I've got her phone number. <laughs> but we just started off as friends, ended up, um, you know, became more. And now, you know, 30 years later and three kids later and, you know, just, uh, you know, uh, living life, you know. Real quick, you mentioned it briefly, but... Uh, the three kids' names and where are they and what are they up to? So my oldest daughter, her name is uh, Brianna, and yep. she's actually in New Zealand and a uh, great kid and uh, graduated from UT marketing. Uh, the second one, his name is Connor, and he, he got the sort of, he's the more analytical numbers kid, yep. and he graduated uh, in finance from University of Arkansas. And then my youngest just started college uh, at University of Oklahoma, and uh, she's decided to get into architecture. So, okay. Great. yeah. Awesome. 
very cool. wildly different kids. Yeah, you know? yeah. So, I have a daughter at OU who's a sophomore. So, oh, really? Yeah. Just one year ahead of her. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, that's awesome. Good. Yeah, great school. It is a good school. Yeah, my yeah. wife went there as well. Yeah. My oldest daughter went there for a semester and then transferred to Arkansas. So all three of our kids have gone to University of Arkansas. Yeah. Uh, What's your daughter in New Zealand doing? She fell in love and uh, she did a semester abroad while she was at University of Texas and um, uh, fell in love with the boy. Um, she ended up coming back, finishing college, kind of coming up with a plan. They lived in... Australia for a couple of years and she worked for marketing firms there mm -hmm. and uh, now she's kind of freelancing her marketing skills and they're starting a business a uh, rent a van business because yes. her and her boyfriend redo they buy vans and redo them and they want to do a little bit of a business that's like a clamping type business absolutely so, yeah are they doing specifically sprinter vans or are they doing all kinds of... Mostly I'd say like old school vans that are refurbished oh, and man, so that awesome. you take camping. So they've done yep. that a couple times. Yep. They've yep. sold them, gone around uh, all the way around New Zealand, all the way around Australia. And now, uh, and she's blending it. She's super creative. So she's blending it with, she'll have books in the van that are like kind of called found that she's actually went and found the books in bookstores with found messages and letters inside the books that are to, from the history of the people that had them. And she's just a super creative soul, you know? So. Sounds like she picked up some of this experience from her dad, you creating know, experiences. Yeah. So the word experiences and in, in, in um, FB society, you know, kind of bring it around is uh, to create experiences never imagined. We have a process when we create brands uh, that we actually really try to follow because it's as a, uh, and anybody knows it's really easy once you have some kind of success and then you open another something do they blend together or do you really keep them separate and so our our whole vision was when we created a brand say like 60 vines uh in the same parking lot of a couple we have whiskey cakes and the idea is a customer would walk into both and say well there's no way these two are related because they're so radically different you know mm -hmm. so and that's sort of our vision that each brand that we create has its own identity its clarity it's not like a say like a Houston's that has a lot of the same, they have different names, but they have a lot of the same products on every menu. We, yep. we don't want to be like that. We want to really kind of go narrow and deep. And, you know, if we're really focused on Texas cuisine, really kind of keep true to that and don't blend it into, say, something else like, uh, you know, um, Napa Valley cuisine, yeah. you know, keep them yeah. different, you know. Let's go back 25 years with uh, Papa's uh, group. Um, walk us through that kind of arc, Jack. What are you learning? What are your roles? Uh, what are takeaways from that experience? Yeah, so Pappas is a, a, an interesting group because they really have their own way of doing things, but it's very siloed. It's very insulated. And uh, so you, you learn there. And at one point, I would say, I kind of like ran out of mentors. I, I was getting promoted sort of above what I really understood or knew. And even in the organization, there, there, there wasn't a depth of talent or knowledge. So as Papado, which was the fastest growing brand, and I was, I was in running that brand and managing people far older than me at the time, it was really kind of like, you know, what, what, you know, where are we going? And, and I just kept asking myself these questions. And so um, what I ended up doing is going back to college. And uh, this time when I went to school, I, it was, I paid for it myself. The company didn't pay for it. Um, and I just really thought, you know, I'm just going to start by taking a night class or two and just kind of like finding direction. And so it, it ended up being a great experience. I went to University of Dallas. Um, I went to their, through their MBA program and I, I went to my wife and I said, look, I know I'm working a lot. I'm traveling all the time. Here's my plan. I'm going to take classes on Monday nights. Uh, I'm going to not watch Monday night football. I'll give that up, right? And she knows I love football. And, um, and then when I'm on the planes flying, I'll, I'll study. And so one of the rules that I created for myself was um, I, I wasn't there to make friends. So I sat in the front row at class, and I'm, I'm actually there to learn. I'm paying for it myself yeah. now. <laughs> A little bit different experience. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> um, then the other rule I had was to read three chapters before class. So I was always ahead uh, when I was doing it. And so all of a sudden it like became so easy to be like an A student. And, and it no was way. really like a revelation you of, cared. yeah, like it, it just made an immediate difference. And so I had a great experience. One of the first professors I had, uh, he walked in the class and he had just finished a consulting gig in Vegas. And he's talking to this management class and saying, guess what the biggest problem was at this casino in Vegas. 
And um, of course, everybody would say, you know, hiring people or different things. And uh, he came up with an answer that I so identified. Uh, he said it was the silverware. And, and, and of course, everyone else in the class is scratching their head. And he's like, well, can anybody figure out why that would be? And I, I, I of course, immediately identified <laughs> this. I said, if you could fix this, the process of how to clean silverware in any of those casinos and F&B outlets, you can fix anything. And he goes, I can't believe you knew that answer. Wow. Well, it's because that was my life. You know? yeah. And so uh, this guy I clearly identified with and really just was like, wow. And so I, I really got into uh, reading the classics, Peter Drucker, and just really kind of thinking about business and applying it to restaurants and process. And um, it just really, as, as operations, it just became something that, you know, I, I became just such a leader in that organization because it was something I was super passionate about. And, mm -hmm. and instead of, uh, you know, now I was kind of leading the charge because my mentors were all these college professors and, and, and books and thinking about how to, you know, take these ideas and apply them to our culture and our processes, you know? Yeah. And I, I want to ask this question before I forget it, because I want to keep going back on that story because it sounded like you got to Dallas at some point. But before I forget it, I love what you said, Jack, and I want you to coach up our uh, viewers and listeners. You said at Papa's, you ran out of mentors. Speak to that issue. Um, if a CEO is listening right now, how do you combat that at FB Society? Coach us around that. So we have, we have a saying at FB Society is uh, hire people smarter than you. And so it constantly keeps you humble and thinking about, okay, I have this guy who's coming up uh, on our team. Here's where he's not as strong. I, I, I don't know how to fix that, but I know people who do. Yeah. So, you know, uh, coming from an organization like um, Pappas that's so insular that they, that's just not their culture um, to really working with a, a partner who we'll get to it eventually, uh, who really taught me how to be transparent and the value of transparency and you, you, our competition is not other restaurants. It, it's the market. Like if the market's up, everybody's going to be up. If the market's down, it's going to be down. And, you know, so this coming from a, a completely different culture where it was in a culture for 25 years that every other restaurant was my enemy to, no, every restaurant's your buddy. Like you like make friends, learn things, grow, you know, and it, it was really a great experience for me and great timing. Are there some pragmatics that you've learned on how to develop a bench at your team above and below you, so to speak? So, yeah, I, I screwed up everything every way you could. So at multiple brands. So uh, a lot of those lessons I'm still learning because you, you never figure it out. It's a moving target. And um, not only your, your personnel is a moving target, but also the business is a moving yeah. target. So aligning it all together, it, it, it's a science and an art. And, and you have to apply both from all the way from analytical testing of personalities to gut feel of uh, going out and having a bourbon with a guy to really understand, or a girl to really understand where they're coming from uh, to make sure they're a right fit for the brand because uh, there's nothing worse than hiring leaders for brands and, and they're not a brand fit or it just doesn't work because it puts you back a couple of years at least. So what brought you to Dallas? So um, Pappas brought me to Dallas. Um, I was in Houston, came to Dallas. Uh, and uh, Papado was very successful in Dallas, and we opened up a few and just had a great experience. Uh, my uh, career with Pappas continued to evolve, and I got more responsibilities of opening all the Pappas's uh, outside of Texas as well, So, which is like Phoenix and Chicago and Atlanta. And so uh, those were all great experiences for me. I ended up personally going to Chicago for two years to open a 30,000-square-foot Papado. And uh, which, uh, you know, was uh, I was running the organization as well as running this one store because it was so important to the organization at the time. Marrying a, a Hawaiian wife who, when I asked her to move to Dallas, thought Dallas was cold. <laughs> you can imagine <laughs> moving to Chicago was an experience, right? So uh, we did last, you know, a year and a half, two years up there. One winter, probably. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It was crazy. Um, but when they offered us the opportunity to come back to Texas, which we really were ready to move back to Texas, um, I said, do you want to move to Houston or Dallas? And we picked Dallas, you know, so uh, eventually they, a couple of years later, they, they had me move back to Houston, but uh, we, we always had a preference for Dallas, you know. Yeah, at Pappas for over 25 years, walk us through, what do you do after you leave Pappas? 
So I, I didn't leave. Uh, I kind of, I got recruited away. Okay. And um, so my business partner, his name's Randy DeWitt. Um, in, and your in, title, sorry to interrupt, well, your title when you left Pappas was? So so it's kind of almost like a COO role, but okay. they, they have different titles there. Yeah. So they call it like senior concept leader. So, yeah. um, but as far as areas of responsibility, yeah. so Randy hired me as, uh, oh, so, well, Randy was, uh, um, you know, really influential in the rest of my career. Uh, he was a restaurateur out of Dallas. Um, you know, he's a, he, you know, kind of came out of real estate. Okay. Um, didn't, didn't really have, he, he had had uh, operations partners, but was really looking for the right one. Um, at the time, his restaurant uh, group uh, got bought by Darden, and that was Rockfish. Okay. Uh, not Darden, I'm sorry, Ch uh, Brinker, Chili's. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. so the Brinker organization had bought his company. Uh, they had opened, they wanted to turn Rockfish at the time into, which was kind of a quirky neighborhood joint yep. into basically the chilies of seafood. Yep. Yep. And um, it, did, it didn't work. They opened too many too fast. Operationally, they were weak. And so we had a common friend that introduced us. And every once in a while, he'd, he'd invite me to they'd say, hey, let's go have dinner. And uh, we'd have dinner. And then, of course, the operational you know freak that I was, <laughs> I'd be like, what temperature are you frying your fish at? You know, and he'd be like, <laughs> I, I don't would know. Would you always meet at Rockfish for dinner? Yeah, not yeah. always. No, we would okay. we would go we would go multiple places. We'd go to Papado. We'd I'd show okay. him what you know yeah. what our coolers looked like and yeah. what we were doing. He'd be like, "Holy cow!" And then you know I'd be like, "Hey, what temperature are you frying your catfish at?" He's like, "I don't know. Let's go find out." You know, and <laughs> we'd go back in the kitchen, and the manager wouldn't know. You know, so it was like this whole experience of really saying he's. And so I think um, Randy saw me as a, a really counterpoint to him, as somebody who was really passionate about operations and cared about these type of details in the business. Um, but at the time he's like, Hey, why don't you come and run rockfish? I'd be like, I'm running a Papado. Are you crazy? Yeah. Like, why, why would I want to do that? And why would I want to work for Brinker? I love, I have so many friends at Brinker. It's a great organization, but at the time, yeah. I, I just Publicly really wasn't my, company. yeah, very, yeah, yeah. Different. exactly. Yeah. Very, very corporate. Yes. Culture. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm not really a corporate culture guy. Yeah. So, um, so, I don't think Philly and corporate culture go all that <laughs> all together. <laughs> I know there's a few corporations there, but yeah, oh, no doubt, no <laughs> doubt. Um, we we had conversations. I'd be like, "Hey, Randy, look, I love you." And so we we would go to dinner at a new seafood restaurant that would open, and we'd go there. Call it six o'clock. We'd close the place down and still talk about restaurants. Yeah. Just so we yeah. found that we were really like kind of kindred souls. We were passionate about the business and about the industry. And so, uh, and I always thought, man, if there was an opportunity, this is a guy I could, I could yep. work with for sure. And um, an opportunity came um, a couple of years, about a year later, you know, he goes, hey, what if um, we do something together, figure out how to get you in the organization? Um, and at that point, he had already bought uh, Rockfish back from Brinker he, he owned it and he actually had put it up for sale. Okay. And uh, the idea was in, uh, this is 2008, um, really the whole market um, in Dallas, when you think about it, it was all chain restaurants, especially out in the burbs. It was yeah, all chain yeah, restaurants. And there weren't as many independent players. And I, I, I think both of us just saw this opportunity of more of an independent style restaurant in the marketplace, not only in Dallas, but but nationally, but yeah. just our, our thoughts at the time were really focused on yep. Dallas. So um, we were in Austin, there was an opportunity and it was uh, actually full circle. I actually have a house right now uh, that I bought a few years ago on Lake Austin and that's really where the opportunity started. Uh, Lake Austin has a little bit of a, a restaurant community mm -hmm. and we were able to potentially get a lease of one and buy the other. And uh, it was an interesting deal. It was almost like a leveraged buyout of this group. And, and it was super complicated, but I was really able from all my learnings at University of Dallas to really understand it, follow along with it. And where the Pappas were so insular about real estate and about deal making and so forth, I hadn't really gotten exposed to it. Yep. Randy was so transparent and I found that like, really like, wow, that was kind of exciting, you know, and level of learning and it was growth different, and, you yeah. know, I, I didn't even know what a management fee was, you yeah. know? And so, uh, you know, and so I, I learned all these things and was really kind of exposed to it. And, um, the deal didn't work out. It, it just didn't work out. And, and we were like, I was like, wow, that was kind of interesting. And, you but know, I learned was, a lot. I learned a lot. And so, uh, about probably about five months later, Randy calls me up and goes, Hey, 
might have a different opportunity. It's in Dallas. You know, there's this property over off of 114 in MacArthur that not only can we start, turn it into a restaurant, uh, but we potentially can buy the property as well. And I was like, I'm certainly interested. I'll be in Dallas next week. Let, let's, let's go tour it. And so uh, we went and looked. It was a Bahama breeze that had closed down. Uh, they were pulling out of Texas. And when you think about Las Colinas, bad soil, but they had spent a fortune getting the building built and doing it. And um, Randy uh, said, hey, what if, um, what if we do something Texas? And uh, it's sort of Randy's gift. He sees a lot of blue sky opportunities. Yep. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so I was like, I think that's a great idea. You know, when what we, the more research we did, uh, so many businesses in Las Colinas were entertaining in Fort Worth that we thought, why don't we just kind of, you know, bring sand to the beach. We'll, we'll open a Texas style restaurant. And um, so, and that was in 2008 and we opened the ranch at Las Colinas. So um, to come full circle on that, uh, this year that just closed, we did 14 and a half million in revenue. It's the busiest year we've ever had at that restaurant. It's over 15 years old and it's got a great clientele and it's, uh, you know, super business friendly and mm -hmm. real neighborhood friendly. And it's yep. been a, you know, just a good business that we've had. And, um, you know, we, we just love it. Now open your first concept together as partners. You move from Houston up to Dallas to really open and run the ranch at Las Colinas. Yes. And it, it, in the interim, uh, Randy had started a brand called Twin Peaks. Okay. And um, Randy, uh, at the time when he kind of came up with this brand, he uh, Rockfish was failing. It wasn't doing all that well. Um, he was a little desperate and thought, man, I, I have... Because he's... Whatever capital he had, he used a lot of it to buy it back. Absolutely. So and now it's continuing to tank. Probably a poor decision by him. Probably a lifelong lesson he's learned there. He learned so much 100%. from those lessons that I was able to really absorb as well, just from his experiences. Correct. You know? And yep. so, and and all those uh, things that happened to him, you know, proved really valuable with Velvet Taco and selling some of the brands that we did over the last couple of years. Yeah, so interesting. He had Louisville uh, that had shut down as a rockfish. And he thought, what, what in this market could I do? Like, what, what could I do with this building instead of being stuck with this lease? And mm -hmm. so he kind of studied the, in Texas, uh, alcohol sales are actually public information. He studied the alcohol roles there in Louisville and found out that the busiest uh, restaurant in alcohol sales was Hooters. And it was continuing to grow every year. And, uh, and I think Brandy thought to himself, like, I, I, I like girls, I like cold beer, I like sports, why don't I ever go to Hooters? What he really did was just study the business model and really look at it and think, wow, I, I think I could do something way better. And mm. uh, so, uh, and there's probably like a million guys that thought that, but nobody really acted upon right, it. Correct, right. right. And, and Randy really did. And, um, you know, Hooters was, uh, had a lot of units and it was a national sort of phenomenon, um, irregardless of the quality or what they were doing. It, exactly. it was one of a kind. And there was really no second place. Uh -huh. So initially the idea was, I'll be second place to Hooters. 100%. But I'm going to do it in a way that's way better. So yep. he had opened up uh, three or four stores um, before I came on and uh, started a, a small franchise program because at the time there wasn't a lot of capital. And um, so I came in and uh, I brought a chef with me. And what we did was we changed every single menu item. No way. Every one, without changing the menu. So if it said hamburger on there, you may have been getting a frozen hamburger, but we switched it to a fresh hamburger. We upgraded the cheese. We added like house made pickles. We we just improved mm -hmm. the quality of the whole thing. And the premise was: is are these guys who are going to Hooters? Are they going to care about the quality of the food? And um, most people said no. They they don't care. They don't care. They do care. Hundred percent, and uh, quality wins. And it, it made Twin Peaks, um, where the market crashed at the end of two thousand eight nine, uh, just into a phenomenon that was actually working, even though the market was bad and um, thing all restaurants were closing. We went from like AUVs of two and a half million to three million up to four million, and we were opening new units, and it, it just. For us, it was like a treasure, treasure trove of new real estate opportunities yep, yep. where we upgraded from C real estate to A real estate. And um, 
And so we, we kind of played that out. And uh, eventually, you know, it, it was great. We had a couple planes. We'd be flying around opening around the country. And we I think we got it to about 60 units. And then uh, we brought in management to run it for us. And then eventually we sold it, uh, rolled on that transaction to some really smart PE guys who actually doubled the sale three years later. And wow. now it's owned by a public company and they're up to about a hundred. What year did you sell it? First time, I'm going to say it was 2015, 16, okay. something yeah. like that. Yeah. And uh, sorry, I cut you off there, yeah. Jack. They're up to how many units now? About 110. Okay. So you took it to 60. You yeah. and Randy take it to 60. So, okay. That stage in your journey, it's you and Randy. You have the one restaurant the Ranch Las Colinas, and you have the Twin Peaks. And at the time, I'd say Twin Peaks wasn't at 60 units because we're, we're serial entrepreneurs. We're totally distracted. So we're probably not even running Twin After Peaks After you get the fifth or sixth one, you're I'm, now already on, on board. Day. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm working on what's next. So uh, probably the next brand we created was Whiskey Cake. Okay. And uh, we uh, really thought that there was this idea of, um, you know, we're suburban dads, right? Yep. So, um, and to get a really good drink at that time, you'd have to go into like uh, Victor Tango's down on Henderson or something to really get a, yep. a really legitimate cocktail. And so we thought, why don't we try to bring that culture out into the burbs? And um, so we, when we opened up Whiskey Cake, the real big difference that, you know, you didn't, the customers didn't really see it, but it, it was, there was no soda guns in the bar. It was actually designed by craft cocktail guys at the time. And we had beautiful, like thick ice before everybody else out in the burbs mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. you know, just stuff that you yep. didn't, you didn't see. And you could actually get a real drink out there. And, uh, and then we blended in some of our personal things. Like it actually has like solar panels on the roof, uh, reclaimed water from the gutters into the uh, landscaping. Um, repurpose wine boxes into coasters. We had this whole sort of philosophy about, you know, sustainability mm -hmm. and renewal and, mm -hmm. you know, making a difference. And so uh, it, it was a brand that just kind of started off and Plano really embraced the brand. Mm -hmm. And I mean, they just mm -hmm. loved it and up on the toll road. And, mm -hmm. and we kind of like started finding our niche. We had a process that we started following when we created new brands. And we have this thing that we call DNA and DNA is um, differentiators, nuances and attitudes. And and when you uh, apply this idea of uniqueness and putting it all on paper before you actually, you know, <laughs> sign the lease, yep. um, you know, you actually are, you know, you have a purpose, a mission, a how to, a, sort of a guidebook of how to do it. And that DNA not only gets used, created by the founders, but it gets passed on to the management team. And that's sort of their true north when they have to make decisions, mm -hmm. you know? So, yeah. um, so whiskey cake kind of came along and then quickly was followed by Velvet Taco. Mm -hmm. And then we created- So you all yeah. started Velvet Taco? We started Velvet Taco. Okay. So we opened the one down at uh, Knox and Henderson and uh, oh, yeah. it was it was a you know phenomenon and uh, it still has a cult-like following and yep. um, we're still investors in it. Um, but we've, you know, we've sold it to private equity, they've sold it again. And so now it's owned by a group out of California that actually took Shake Shack public. And so okay. um, we're hoping that they continue to grow and the the, Actually, the leaders are people that we actually hired, and they're great and going the right way. So FB Society, is this still you and Randy? Yes. What's your process thinking through an acquisition? Whether you, Have you ever bought a concept? Do you only sell concepts? What, what, what's some of your all's DNA yeah. in your business? So um, we, we have bought, um, so we bought a catering company, and it's um, you know, a local catering company here, and we bought 70% of it. We put it on our platform. Um, it went from 1.5 million in revenue to, I think we had forecasted 12 million in revenue. Um, and we had someone who approached us uh, last year about purchasing it and, and we, we ended up selling it. And we've actually been in uh, a series of acquisition opportunities the last couple of years. And, um, you know, we're, we're open to that as a possibility. Mm -hmm. We think mm -hmm. that there's more of that. So then that's one way we do it. And then secondly, the way we do it is um, personally. So uh, over the years, um, we try to you know invest in small startups. We kind of started with restaurants, and then we started other companies. But uh, help guys where we actually kind of sort of put put capital into it, but also you know advice and just sort of help them to either um, create some infrastructure or some opportunities of where where to grow and how to grow. And because it's um, you know restaurants 
in particular, they're complicated businesses. Mm -hmm. You know, you need to have real estate experience. You need to really have strong financial experience. And so uh, it, it takes years for people to get that. And so since we've <laughs> screwed everything up and learned, you know, um, people well, are able to benefit. That's what rep, reps will do that for you, right? Yeah. You do it enough times. But there's there's a local company called uh, Truck Yard, which uh, yep. I'm actually an investor with Jason Basso, the founder of that. Mm -hmm. And um, he has a, a, same, a similar brand under the same umbrella called Second Rodeo that's in Mule Alley in Fort Worth that does really well. And uh, we're about to open one in Oklahoma City. And, uh, you know, it's just a brand that I, I really enjoy. I think it's cool. And I think, uh, you know, I like their leadership team a lot. And mm -hmm. I, I just um, enjoy working with groups like that. And so, uh, you know, we've diversified. Uh, Randy's done the same with, he's on the board of Uchi and, um, you know, takes a personal stake in it, but then is on the board, makes, mm -hmm. you know, advisory roles. And so I, I, ideally, that's sort of how we do it personally. And, um, you know, continue, we'll have plenty of, and then there's other companies where uh, we've been involved in some tech companies that are more restaurant focused, uh, some consumer brands that, that bleed into restaurants and things like that, that are just personal investments that uh, I think are a lot more fun than just buying more shares of Microsoft yeah. Yeah. Or, or NVIDIA, although they did very well. You know? sure. so. so right now, how many, how many concepts do you guys have that you're not, not, not the personal side, but just yeah. with the business with the business right now. So we're kind of in a, um, the food hall company, which is a whole nother thing about food halls. We, we have um, a business that we set up called the food hall company. It actually has a CEO over that and infrastructure and separate offices and uh, we have one, the one in Plano, if you've been to uh, Legacy West, the, that food hall is ours. And, uh, and then there's another one in Nashville at Fifth and Broadway, where we have the Ryman Theater on one side and Brigstone Arena on the other. Wow. And it's about 115,000 square feet. It's wow. really uh, wow. big. And so, and we're, we're, we're actually just about to finalize our third one, which will be in Manhattan. Very and cool. uh, it, so that, that business is an interesting business. It's a hard business, but, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's really... Uh, a bunch of mom and pops across the country and there's no really true leader of the food hall business and we sort of envision our company the food hall company really being that in the future and uh and then one of our other Which philly has i wonder why did this remind me the name of it um yeah it's the market it's reading uh, terminal yes yes so does the did that shape any of the food hall no i i think it would be the exact opposite of where we're going where it's kind of like really old school and got it's got like um groceries and stuff and exactly something like just, you'd see in europe yeah yeah, yeah. 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 and yeah, yeah. but but I, I would say a different version of europe europe is more um i'd say entrepreneurial uh europe is more uh specialized food reading terminals like a place to get something to eat yep um in europe it's it's like uh an experience because uh you know so i with this business, which actually the big idea actually came from a, tour, a trip to Amsterdam coming from Russia because we were opening restaurants there. So it, it was this whole idea of um, the whole group out at uh, Chops of Legacy West, Femi Carahan, you know, and, and uh, the whole team in Vesco behind that. Uh, he came to Randy and I said, hey, look, he, he brought me a napkin when Shops of Legacy was just an idea and still owned by J.C. Penney. And he wrote on this napkin, look, hey, I have this one block. And it's sort of like the block that I want to do, like something that would be a legacy. Mm. And um, he wrote Fun Place on the napkin. He goes, hey, you and Randy are the funnest guys I know. Let's, let's come up with a big idea and do something special. And, uh, you know, Femi is, as uh, you know, a developer, probably one of the more entrepreneurial ones that he really liked dwelled into this and really like pushed us to come up with these ideas. We traveled, you know, to LA, New York, just saw some new ideas, weren't really inspired. And so happened when we were in Europe, we saw this terminal that this group had turned into a food hall. And the interesting thing about it, and this is about 2016, they actually ran uh, the bars. And so we kind of like flew back to the States and thought about, Wow, um, what if we came up with this idea of the restaurant tours food hall? You know, we're we're not really food hall guys, but we 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 really yep. know restaurants and it's our specialty. So why don't we you know kind of put this model together? And so we did, and we came back and we studied what was in the U.S. And at the time, it, the 
two really big food halls in the U.S. were Chelsea Market in New York mm -hmm. and uh, the L.A. Uh, downtown market. They both were incredibly busy at lunch and dead at dinner. Mm -hmm. And in Plano, that wasn't just going to work for, yeah, the, yeah. for the rent we had to pay. Yeah. So um, we, we really wasn't going to get you a deal on that. No, no. He, he's a businessman, <laughs> exactly. as he should be, right? So we kind of came up with this idea of, um, you know, we called it the box garden. And it was a live music stage. And how do you drive people to see live music that could be free every weekend? And then they would spend money on the drinks and it would drive food and mm -hmm. traffic. And so that's that's what our model became. And we learned a lot of lessons. Like we actually started off cashless, which was fascinating to do, you know, back then in 2017. Um, and but what it what it really is is a model that as the cash comes into the vendors, um, if you're uh, a guy, a chef who wants to do pizza mm -hmm. and you get into the, the food hall, it's a very low startup cost. Mm -hmm. There's no personal guarantees. So the long-term risk of your career is, is kind of safe. And um, you get paid every week by the food hall mm -hmm. on your revenues because mm -hmm. we collect all the money, subtract Digital. the expenses and just get it right back out to them. Yeah. So it's, it's a really different model, but it's kind of a cool model. And, um, you know, I, I think a lot of the food halls, you've seen them open and close, but you know, ours tend to be really busy, high volume, and um, you know, it's it's been an interesting ride. That's great. So that so you got that brand, yes, that you're working on. Anything else, or has yeah, everything so, else been transacted? So, no. So we have um, a group of restaurants we call Whiskey Cake Holding, and that is Sixty Vines, Mexican Sugar, uh, and uh, Whiskey Cake. Okay. And we have a CEO that runs that. He reports into us as a board, and um, that's in fast growth. Now we have a platform where. Uh, we have shared uh, CFO and sort of yep. services that we yep. share with them. But Whiskey Cake, I think, is up to about 11 units. Uh, Mexican Sugar, we just opened one in Uptown around the corner here. Okay. And uh, and we've got a few more, probably one or two a year. The brand that's really growing the fastest is 60 Vines. Sure. And 60 Vines, uh, I'm going to say we have about nine now, and we're opening four more this year. Yep. We just opened in uh, Charlotte, um, Reston, Virginia. We've got Miami, Orlando, and Washington, D.C. under construction. Mm -hmm. So um, that brand is really a brand that, uh, you know, we, we took that sustainable platform that we kind of started at Whiskey Cake. And as we learned about kegging um, and how it could apply to wines and how it was, you know, it, I mean, you save uh, 30 bottles and labels and corks from a landfill every time that you're serving a drink. So it's it's really a cool thing. and. One of the unintended things of that is is what it meant for developers. So as developers were building, um, you know, the lead sort of lead uh, demands are yep. so much higher and sustainability that actually by bringing sixty vines into your portfolio or on your property helps bring your needs so much lower because it's such a sustainable brand and not only internally, you know, are they do they have the kegs, but also just all their practices and what they believe in. So it's really mm, a, it's uh, been a great story. And then, you know, for the consumer, it just gives them such great choices. You know, you can determine what size of uh, yep. wine you want to sample. You can say, hey, I'm really into Sauv Blancs. I want to try one from France, one from Napa, and one from New Zealand. And yep. so it really kind of gets you to order it the way you want to try it, depending on, you know, and there's there's no not wine snobbery. We you know mm -hmm. we we call it no pinkies out, right? Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, accessible. Yeah, and, and easy. And then if you are a person who's really into wine, they curate those and they get specialty ones that are done by winemakers where Wine is a really slow moving craft. So just, you could just imagine like switching from corks to screw offs. It, it's been like years in the making. Mm -hmm. So kegging started off the same way, Interesting. but the sustainability of it at the same time as they're going through huge changes with wine on sustainability of grapes and how they're treating their, you know, their farms and what they're doing. It's, it's really becoming super accepted where when Randy and I first started it, we, we would go to Aspen Food and Wine Festival and talk to these guys, and they, they were like laughing at us. And now, <laughs> you know, they're all lining up. And um, when we first opened the first 60 Vines, we partnered- Where was that? That was in Plano. It was in Plano. The, the first, first one, one was Plano. The second one was at the Crescent, Yep. which is a theme for front burner. We tend to open brands in the Burbs and then move them into Uptown, which is very unusual. Yeah, right? it is unusual. So, yeah, it's kind of um, flip-flopped. Yeah, yeah. 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 We, 
partnered with this really great winemaker, right? And he, he was like the winemaker of like Chalk Hill and he, he was an amazing guy, had super high standards. So we did these wines where we thought, okay, let's forecast, we sell one keg a week, you know, of, of this, uh, you know, cab, you know? Yep. The first week you sold 20 kegs of that Holy one cow. cab, you know? Wow. So, and it, but it was like, it was estate grown wines and yep. we thought a branded 60 vine wine, how well is that gonna sell? And it was actually where the consumer really went because they really tasted the quality of them. And it really, so it's really kind of been an exciting ride with that. So, and, and you know, for me, I get to learn this journey of all, all about wines, yep. all about bourbons at uh, whiskey cake, all about tequilas and Mexican sugar. So um, it's, it's a never ending uh, part cool. of our, our journey. So as I listen, uh, and this is part of the benefit of us not, you know, 100% yeah. pre, uh, pre prescribing the conversation. So I'm listening to the story of you and Randy, you guys have, you know, you've bought concepts, you've invented concepts, you've transacted concepts, you've had a second bite at the apple on concepts. You said a minute ago, you know, we're serial entrepreneurs. Like, so, you know, one of the things that we try to speak to in the podcast is, is exiting and what an exit looks like and what you're going to do post exit. You guys, you know, as you exit, you've already got the next, you know, the next idea sort of spun up. How do you, how do you or you and Randy think about the future and when do you get off the train? Like, when do you stop inventing the next concept and just, relax or maybe you don't a smelling the roses is something that we both decided to do a few years ago mm -hmm. you know um he transitioned to uh a less active role i, I became ceo yeah. um and uh how old are you jack i'm 60 60 yeah okay. and um so but at the same time uh, you know i think uh thinking deeply about how we spend our time personally mm -hmm. where his family uh has a part of the world they really like to live in they spend a lot more time there uh, with my family, kind of how I told you I took time yeah. out to really find time. Yeah. And um, mm -hmm. as it became an empty nester last year, my wife and I really started. And, and it's kind of funny on the journey um, where my wife has really raised my kids uh, her whole life. We've really worked deeply in the last year of transitioning to this idea of we're, we're traveling more. We just got back from Hawaii last week. And, and um, me and my succession planning in the organization uh, have a uh, talented enough crew that I, I don't have to be at the office every day. Mm -hmm. So, um, and what my contributions are, are really more strategic and, yep. and, and as an idea person, yep. um, and, uh, I surround myself with people that can execute them and, uh, you know, who are better at it than me. So, uh, I think that's ultimately the type of organization I, I really want to create. So I hear you saying, I'm going to keep doing this for a long time. But I mean, I'm, ideas are, I, I don't think I could turn off the tap. Um, if, hmm. I, if I retired on a beach, I'd probably spend my ideas of walking up and down the beach trying how to start a new business. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, we, we've talked a lot about the fact that you can't take the entrepreneurialism out of the entrepreneur. Yep. Like yeah. it's innate, it's in there. It, you know, this idea of retiring or, you know, it's, it's hard for the entrepreneur because they're sitting on the beach and you're, thinking about the next idea. So yeah, makes and a lot I, of sense. I think though, um, I think there is a, you know, um, an idea like my organization, I feel like if I'm slipping, I want to be cognizant of For the sure. fact that I'm able to really let it transition to the next phase. Um, we almost treat our, our organization like a law firm where over the years on say ownership, I've, I've actually bought Randy down in ownership. And then ideally we have young people on our team who are going to buy me down and they, they can have the majority of ownership in the organization. And I think that's a, a pretty progressive idea of how yep. to run a company today. Yeah, absolutely. And especially a restaurant company, I can't think of one that does it like that. Mm -hmm. So, but we were kind of really trying to think about those goals of, you know, how, how do we keep this company um, evergreen mm -hmm. and last longer and be bigger than ourselves and have it go on to other generations where people can get the benefit of keeping you know, experiences coming into the consumers and DFW specifically and keep it special, you know, and the ideas I think that we could create the next couple of years should keep it, you know, really moving forward. If you're watching and listening, I want you just to hit the rewind button because I thought what you just said there, Jack, incredibly powerful. You say it so easily. Um, you and Randy wanted to build something that was bigger than yourself, last much longer than yourself 
you would end up owning a much bigger thing as well because you're part of something bigger than yourself. And I think so many leaders, um, again, if we're at the epicenter of all of that, then it's no bigger than ourself. And you guys really somehow got that mind shift where those conscious out loud conversations that you and Randy had. Um, I think, think they you, were experiences. So yeah. um, you could imagine this. So if you go back in time, 15 years, right? You're the guys that own Twin Peaks. So you, you've got food critics. <clears throat> you got all these people that sneer at you, you know. <laughs> yeah. A uh, lot of critics. A lot of critics, right? Um, people who are super self-righteous, you know. And the reality of it is we, we try to create the greatest culture, try yep. to treat people well. You know, it was always yep. our mission. And so we had uh, started this, this plan to do whiskey cake. And a local food writer heard about it. And she heard that our partners in this were the guys who owned Bolsa. And if you remember Bolsa, oh, yeah. the, it, it was like the hottest restaurant in the city. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, that place. it just befuddled her. Like, why the hell would these guys from Bolsa want to work with these yo-hos from um, Twin Peaks? Twin Peaks? <laughs> and like, that's like so weird. And it doesn't, and so when you think of great restaurateurs, you know, say in the United States, you know, where uh, Richard Melman, you yeah. know, uh, Richard Melman had bars before he ever had the upscale uh -huh. restaurants that he had in Chicago. And so they were so snotty about it and so rude, um, that they wrote these horrible articles before we even opened. And before we, even, they didn't even know us or, Correct. you know, or my background or Randy's. And so it was so judgmental and sometimes in the restaurant business, it can be that way. And yeah. so, um, and that's, that's kind of what we're all of a sudden, we actually didn't have a website till last year. Yeah. Um, we, and it kind of scarred us that, well, let's just keep our businesses super separate. And yeah. so what it did is kind of keep us super humble because what we would do is the focus would be on the brand, never on Jack and Randy, never yep. on FB. And um, that was sort of sort of what, mm -hmm. what started was by uh, some Yahoo critic who just like was, so, it just scarred us how mean they were. And it's like, <laughs> oh man, you know, we're, we're gonna do this restaurant. You've just inspired us to make it even better. You know, but uh, the judgmentalness of yep. some people was just sort of really off-putting. And we, so I, I think it just kind of made our style is, let's not worry about it. Let's just create great brands, you know, make those the websites, get people focused on that. And, um, you know, Randy and I, I think have always really flown under the radar. People mm -hmm. don't know uh, that uh, really the connection of a lot of these brands, unless yep. they learn it organically. And once they learn it organically, they're kind of intrigued by it. Mm -hmm. um, but nationally, we, we probably get more attention than we get locally. Just had that conversation the other day. That is so common. Um, you know, there's no honor uh, in the prophet's hometown. So typically it's, it's, and if we've known somebody too long, we just write it off, make mm -hmm. excuses, or outside. Um, what would you say the the biggest trend in the restaurant industry is right now that that you guys are sort of facing or dealing with or con concerned about, working on, whatever, however you want to define it? Well, there's there's an interesting trend right now of um, declining alcohol sales. That's um, exactly where why I asked you the question. Yeah, as a person who's involved in the business and a person who's um, you know sort of. Uh, you know, wa watching, you know, just trends in general, but, um, and it kind of started with beer, um, mm -hmm. beer over the years where the craft beer trend was so strong. Uh, then it seems like people really started thinking, wow, I drink a heavy IPA and man, I can't eat anything after yeah. that. Right. So, uh, and then, um, then people have gone back to light beers and, and there's a younger audience today who's really just more into <clears throat> seltzers and ranch waters and lighter things. And, um, and then I, I think there's the whole uh, health thing of people just saying, hey, is alcohol really good for me? And mm -hmm. is it, what's it really make, how is it really making me feel? And I think people are just so much more mindful of A, what they put in their mouth, mm -hmm. uh, whether it be food or alcohol, and then um, how, it, how it impacts them and makes them feel. And so, and I think this whole thing of people who are using diet drugs, I think they, they can't drink alcohol while they do it. And there's a lot of people on them. And so, yeah. Uh, I think there's a series of things, and then all of a sudden, something like Dry January comes up, right? And so it's just really interesting. Mm -hmm. So I think that so how that's impacted the restaurants is uh, people are drinking better quality things. They're not drinking as many of them, but they're really upping the quality. So mm -hmm. if they're going to order a glass of wine, they're like, I'm going to get this really good glass of wine. Interesting. Um, yep. I think people are drinking cleaner tequilas. I yep. mean, uh, right now... Uh, 
some of the really good tequilas, you can't even keep them in stock. You can't find them in the liquor stores because they're organic, they're no fillers, they're really, you know, I can taste the difference when, when I drink a non-filler tequila. And I mm -hmm. think there's a lot of consumers that are really into that. And, and uh, but I, I think that's kind of some of the things that are driving that trend. And yeah. And I, I, I don't think it's going to decline. I think it's going to kind of kind of keep the way it is. And um, people fall in and out of drinking. I don't think they're, it, you know, when in my generation, it was kind of like cool to be the drunk guy at the party. You know, uh, it mm -hmm. was okay. You know, yep. you were a cool guy if you were yep. drunk at the party. Um, I think in my kids generation especially with cell phones and things like that i think it's really changed behavior that they don't want to be the drunk guy at the party mm -hmm. they don't want to see the video that gets circulated mm -hmm. the next day mm -hmm. and so like the impact mm -hmm. on dwi it's i think it's i don't know the actual records right now but it, it has to have gone yeah. down i mean it's yeah. really got to be and with the it, you know advent of uber and things like that right. i mean it's really it, you just don't hear about it as much well my, yeah. my question was purely selfish yeah. But I'm so glad you went there because I, I, you know, personally, I'm, Doug knows, but you know, health has always been a big part of my life, and and I like to have a really good glass of wine, or I yeah. like to have a my, you know, my weakness is the, you know, the sugary margarita. Like yeah. I, I love a really oh, yeah. good frozen margarita. Um, and then you know, more recently, old fashions have sort of you know come onto the radar sure. screen. But I hate the way it makes me feel just from a health perspective. Yeah. And so I've actually been doing a lot of personal research on it, I'm on my third book uh, since the first of the year, just on alcohol and what it does and you know the physiological, the physical, and and then at the same time, I read in the Wall Street Journal on a regular basis, you know, um, beer sales declining and um, mm -hmm. the most, I think there's an article this week that the highest grossing beer is a non-alcoholic beer. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know what the time really? frame is, but, um, so I, I'm, I was very curious yeah. to see if you were seeing and experiencing yeah. the same thing because I certainly see it culturally. Yeah. I think there there is something going on for yeah. sure. You could you could you know just look at the alcohol sales and um, you know and see that. I do think that the opportunity when like uh, health wise, like in how you how it makes me feel. What I've done is really focus on the food I'm eating with the alcohol mm -hmm. I'm drinking. You know, and again mm -hmm. back to the clean tequilas. If I, if I drink clean tequila, and even if I imbibe one too many, uh, I never wake up with a hangover, mm -hmm. and it makes me feel differently. Yeah. And when I drink it with uh, food in particular, I just find that it enhances my experience. Yeah. And I think that that's where the consumer's gonna go is um, you know, alcohol that enhances an experience and makes it special. And I, I think too, there's, there's stories behind some of these alcohols that are like fascinating when I, um, you know, read about that. And, and again, back to investing, I, I actually invest in a, um, a spiritless organization that's actually female, uh, led and founded out of Austin called spiritless, where they actually distill the alcohol, um, and then take the alcohol out yep. of it. And so there's a lot of like mocktails, um, some our menus are all growing in that direction yeah. because that's what yep. the consumer is looking for. And uh, I, I think it's growing. We were on vacation over the holidays and we went to a restaurant and the, and the bar, the bar menu was focused around gin and it said, you know, gin drinks, not gin drinks, almost gin drinks or something like that. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and they were, they had Tanqueray zero proof mm -hmm. as the, as the, um, the liquor yeah. and then but they were making gin and tonics and i had one and like i was like this is great i drink this all day long and no alcohol in it yeah. mm -hmm. but it was a tanqueray brand which i thought was interesting I yeah i seen that before oh it's it's all coming in a big way yeah and so these um they've actually the growth of this company is up like two thousand percent last wow. year so it's it's really uh and there there's really kind of three or four big companies that are uh doing it uh aside from like an absolute you mm -hmm. know all right so i got another question so you guys were the awarded the uh, or you were the CEO of the year for ENY for the Southwest region. Um, tell us about that process and why you think they chose you because it's a very rigorous, rigorous process. Uh, and congratulations, by the way. Thank you. It was it was actually um, Entrepreneur of the Year, not Thank CEO you. of Thank the you. Year. But um, yeah, no, uh, I I think um, some of what happened when uh, COVID hit. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you had leaders and followers, right? And so our organization was one of the leaders. And so we created, um, we really led our, our flag fly, our freak flag fly um, on our creativity um, yeah. and we unleashed it. And the way that we did that was with each brand, uh, we turned whiskey cake basically into a grocery store. 
we had parking lots full of people who mm. needed uh, help of actually getting groceries. And it's interesting because the groceries you get at your grocery stores, um, restaurants have a different channel. Mm -hmm. So where you couldn't get milk and you couldn't get toilet paper, restaurants had abundance of it. Mm. So what we would do is put these family packs together and we would add toilet paper and milk to them. And people would just fill up the parking lot to come really? get these things. Love that. And so, you know, um, at uh, Mexican <clears throat> Sugar, we wanted to create an experience um, that people, I think, were missing because they couldn't get out of their houses. Yep. So we would actually hire mariachis to come and play at the to-go area. So when people came in, they could get to-go margaritas and food and just kind of like feel a little bit of what they used to feel, right? Mm -hmm. So at um, Haywire, we actually created this whole program around Psalms and we got level five Psalms. Uh, we put them in Stetsons. So we called it Psalms and Stetsons. And what we did was they sold our whole inventory of, of wine of the whole building. So they were selling all the way from first growth Frenches down to just local Texas wines. Wow. And people would pull up, we'd give yep. them that, the Psalm would kind of talk them through it. And then they would just uh, fill up the trunk and just go on. And so we really kind of let that happen. At the same time, we had a little bit of a challenge, long-term challenge in Front Burner. Our name had been called Front Burner, but we couldn't get a trademark on it. There's another company that actually had the trademark in Florida uh, for a restaurant company that was called Front Burner. So we kind of went through this whole, you know, new process. We came up with the name FB Society. Uh, basically, you know, we're a society of people that, who really want to create experiences. Um, the FB is a nod back to front burner, which is mm -hmm. always going to be part of our legacy. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that was a, a sort of a big unveiling. And so we went, we did a lot of things where all of a sudden, instead of coming out of COVID limping, yep. we, we were sprinting we were and uh, we were looking for new real estate. We really believed in the brands and, so we, we came out of it really strong and, and had, you know, great couple of years since then. And, um, you know, so that was part of the big discussion with, uh, you know, EY or one of them, as yep. well as, you know, just kind of how we really want to create experiences and some of the specific things we do in our different restaurants. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. How big is the team now at FB? Well, it, again, it like when you think of FB um, and you think of the whole organization, right? So we're, we're majority owners of the whole company, but because we're moving in so many different directions, we're actually looking at what's next, I think. And uh, because we have the leadership teams in place to grow our existing brands, uh, one of the local brands, uh, Haywire, uh, which has been incredibly successful up at the Shops of Legacy and in Uptown and, and our, our original one at the ranch at Las Colinas. Uh, we're growing 100% uh, this year. Mm. So we have them opening in uh, the Domain in Austin, uh, Houston and Memorial, and uh, in La Cantera in San Antonio. Mm -hmm. So 100% growth. In order to do that, you know, our infrastructure had to grow. We had to make some really big decisions on, um, you know, putting, creating roles to be able to execute that. And so... Um, you know, that's, that's how we're challenging ourselves on, you know, to, to grow and get more effective, you know, uh, Jack, as we, um, uh, kind of land the plane here, uh, one of our favorite exercises to do at the end is, um, you got two minutes with a hundred CEOs. What are you going to give them? You know, yeah. one, one of the things I think about, you know, as an entrepreneur, is a uh, profit isn't a four letter word. You know, I, I think that if you don't create good margins in your business that you're mm. creating, you can't hire the best people, you can't pay people well. So I, I always think a lot about the business model and creating great margins that make the business really exciting and something that you can bring in more talent for. Um, the goal is not to create, you know, be, be the world's wealthiest guy, but it's to create a healthy organization mm. where you could pay people the, and attract the best people. And so you need to have a healthy business to do that. And I yeah. think, uh, you know, don't fall in love with your own ideas. I think uh, a lot of people tend to do that. And I, I think there's a, a value in surrounding yourself with people that, you know, keep you real and humble and, you know, just thinking about, hey, some of your ideas ain't that great. <laughs> and that's a fact of life, you know? Dude, this is incredible. Uh, and I think I, I know I speak for Scott. I love your candor. I love your directness. Good old Philly. Uh, tell it how it is. Um, I love your humility, how you um, talk about you all tried so many things. You've made so many mistakes. Um, thank you for taking time uh, to coach up uh, our, our listeners and viewers. Um, 
If you listen to Decision Points with Jack Gibbons, you're going to be smarter and wiser, and you're going to make better choices. Thanks for your time. Thanks for your time.